Um, okay, so here I am. This my name's Atif Chowdhury. I'm one of the founding directors of Diversity and Ability at DNA. Um, and I'm really proud to really be here to talk about Disability History Month and share a conversation with you. Uh, I know some of you have been following our work for a while uh, and some of you might be new to it. Um, and what we want to do is just introduce you to some of the ideas and the challenges that really make disability inclusion be more meaningful. So to join me in that journey, I've got a wonderful friend, Roddy Slorak, who is the author of the book, A Very Capitalist Condition. It's a book on the history and the politics of disability. And Roddy is also a colleague working very well to support disabled students at one of the most famous STEM universities in the world, Imperial College London. And joining Roddy and I, it, we have Cameron Malik. Cameron is a good friend. I like to consider him a dear friend. And he's also the current chief executive of Disability Rights UK. Uh, and through all of that, Cameron has, has a lived experience championing inclusion and uh, has many conversations with me about how we get this stuff stronger and more meaningful, especially for marginalized communities who don't always get to access the kind of conversations that often different class groups get to normalize. So without further ado, I thought we would explore this and really be as comfortable and as casual as we can be, guys. Um, and sort of introduce ourselves and then sort of tackle on, tackle just three or four questions. But Roddy, could I get you to just sort of start off really and just say a few words about yourself? Sure. Um, I uh, guess that I should just say that I've been kind of got interested in disability uh, from quite a young age. Uh, when I was at university, I was a uh, attending lectures in a cavernous wooden lecture theatre, probably about 300 of us and I uh, find it very difficult to hear. <laughs> and um, I refused to wear hearing aids, however, because I was far too va vain and I was still a teenager and you know, you're know you very concerned about yourself, image and all that kind of stuff. But uh, it took me a long time to actually accept uh, that I needed to wear not just one, but two hearing aids uh, in order really to be able to function properly. And, um, but that has kind of tipped me into an interest because I very quickly found out I was in very much uh, the minor league when it comes to disability in terms of the impairment and its impact upon me. And I therefore started working with organisations of disabled people uh, with a, a voluntary organisation called the Disability Awareness Resource Group, where I discovered the social model and the writings of Michael Oliver, which at that time were very new. And so therefore um, started then um, getting very enthusiastic about these ideas and um, began working um, more actively in the disability movement. Yeah. So that's kind of where all this comes from for me, if you like, and ever since I've been kind of in and out of the subject um, and uh, then felt uh, once I came into higher education, it started prompting my interest in writing uh, as well as act activism, if you like. And it just seemed a natural fit, therefore, to start writing more about the politics of disability, particularly given the increasing interrogation about the actual impact of the Disability Discrimination Act and its successor, the Equality Act, uh, as these are issues that have become increasingly polarised and controversial, in my view. Mm. Great. Great. Thank you. Thank you. And, and Cameron, would you say, say some words about yourself and whatever you feel really is compelling for you at this period in time? Sure. Um, so, yeah. Uh, so I, I was I was kind of born in Pakistan, uh, got polio at the age of three. And so life took a dramatically different route uh, for me and my parents. Uh, came to the UK when I was, I was about seven when I came to the UK, couldn't speak any English, um, uh, suddenly surrounded by people who were very different to me culturally, um, religious wise, uh, how they looked. And um, it feels like I've been trying to fit in ever since. <laughs> um, you know, I remember going to school, special school, as it was called in my day when I was younger, it was called the School for the Physically Handicapped and um, uh, being bullied by a white disabled guy who would pick on me because of my colour and it was the first time I'd experienced that and um, 
he would be calling me names that I didn't really understand what all the what the reasons behind it was. Um, and I remember I used to go and ask my dad, you know, what, what's all that about? And he would, you know, tell me. So kind of learned at a very young age how not only was I different as a disabled person, but I was now different because of the color of my skin. Um, and also it's, it's interesting being removed from your own culture, really, suddenly coming into the UK. Um, you know, you're physically removed from being immersed in the culture that I was, I was born from. Um, and as I got, got older, you know, went to mainstream school again, I was uh, one of, there's only two visually, visually disabled people in the high school that I was in. Um, again, it was a very white school, very few people of color, um, black or brown. Um, and I, I really, really un, only got into disability. It's interesting, in my younger age at that point, I was very dismissive of other disabled people. I didn't want to be part of the disability community. I didn't want to be labeled as a disabled person. I was just Cameron and I, I had things I wanted to do. It was only when I got working and entered the kind of career and found myself by chance working for a disabled people's organization where there was, I was on it for a secondment for a short period. That I suddenly learned about the social model and it was that kind of light bulb moment. It was quite liberating in the sense that um, I had accepted that actually the problems was all with me. And, you know, I, I didn't look good enough. I didn't, um, I couldn't amount to doing the things that everybody else was doing. Uh, my dad always said about kind of working that much harder, having to prove yourself. Um, and when I learned about the, uh, the, the social model and entered that world, I've kind of stayed in it ever since. It's, I've built a career in there um, and just kind of driven that lived experience as the kind of the, the, you know, the flame that drives my passion really about not wanting the next generation of disabled people to experience the same level of discrimination, exclusion that I experienced. And as I've got older, thinking about the intersectionality of it all um, and how those multiple um, levels of exclusion uh, combine to uh, really kind of hold you back. Um, and that kind of that's what drives me. Um, and uh, I've spent a long time working in running local disabled people's led organizations at a grassroots level. Um, and now at Disability Rights UK, it's about taking that lived experience voice of disabled people from around the country and using it to influence kind of much higher level uh, policy, legislation, government thinking, so we can make global changes rather than just very local ones. Thank you, Cameron, that's quite touching. The intersectionality of the discussion and how it goes, it, it's, it's almost, it's filled with richness and joy, but also I think a lot of sadness that it still feels so elusive to so many people. And often people are caught in sort of the tribalism of, even within the disability movement itself, uh, they very rarely look at the double or the treble impacts. Um, and for me, I guess, I personally find, I suppose it's why I find our, our conversations both with both of you separately so enriching is that without a, a narrative that looks at class struggle, um, all of this is just sort of posturing around rights and how people should be better, not recognizing what social barriers affect the attitudes that actually prevent us having any voice and agency in the first place. What are the barriers that say your opinion matters um, and that without your opinion, we can't make this better. You know? We need these lived experiences as an asset. Yeah. Um, so I'm, always, I'm forever compelled by that. And yet watching the, the, the strength I'm careful around the words like resilience because I always think it has some shaming language to it, but just the strength of collective action and the collective- Words action. like what, sorry? Resilience. Resilient, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I think it can mean, you know, it's almost like, oh, you're not resilient enough or you are resilient or you're very inspiring. <laughs> but really I'm, I'm much more excited by collective action and how lived experiences are welcomed as an asset. That they're really showing you where the, where the holes are in policy and how we make sure that we're anticipating that a lot of people don't get to be part of these voices mm. because of the way they've been brought up, 
because of the lack of access to conversations, because their skin color left them being prevented from being part of the party. Yeah. Um, so I guess I'm going to go to the questions really, and and um, I'm really inviting you to sort of challenge the questions as well. Um, but I'm going to just start off with some of them. The focus of this year's International or well, Disability Month for this year, uh, I would like to just guys you guys to explore what it means to you, perhaps even what you think it should be. A conversation Roddy and I had, which was really colourful, was just to even ask whether they even should be a Disability History Month. Right. Um, you know, I think that that's, you know, it's not a question I can answer in such a blanket term. I've got thoughts and feelings about what it brings us closer to. Um, did, you, did you come to a viewpoint on that conversation last week? We came to a wonderful position that says, uh, well, um, listen, I think I'm going to chuck it to you guys actually first. <laughs> I'm in danger of not sharing it and just and answering a perspective. But um, so I guess I will, I will add to it, but I suspect knowing you both of you, I think we're going to have very similar positions on this. So let me ask the question really. The focus on Disability History Month this year is on impact. Sorry, it's not, it's on access. <laughs> Giving myself away there. Um, <laughs> it's on... Uh, it's on access. Is that the right thing to focus on this year? Um, and I guess a, 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 a provocation is, should we have a Disability History Month itself? So on the, on the point, is it the right, is it, it you know, should it be access? Mm -hmm. I, I guess what my question would be is, is, is um, when thinking about access, how broad are we talking? Because I think my immediate thought when someone says, let's talk about access, the immediate thing is kind of the obvious stuff, you yeah. know, the physical built environment. But access is much broader than that. It can be. Depends on your kind of where you're coming from to it. Mm -hmm. um, so in, in terms of how I'd be thinking about it, it's, it's, it's access to my community. It's access to live the life that I want to live. It's access to public life, if that's what I want to choose to be uh, doing. So it can be very broad. I think it's kind of relevant because at the same time we're celebrating or marking, if not celebrating, you know, 25 years of the Disability Discrimination Act, 10 years of the Equality Act. We, we are at a moment where the government is talking about building this um, ambitious, as these are their words, ambitious strategy for disabled people in the disability strategy. Um, and so kind of thinking forwards into the future, what is it we want? What have we learned from the DDA? Where have, where have the difficulties and challenges been? What hasn't worked and why? And how can we stop repeating the same mistakes over and over again in the future? Because, uh, you know, looking back to when I was starting off in my career and what frustrates me is we haven't moved fast enough. Uh, we need to be moving much faster because generations of disabled people are experiencing the continued discrimination and the lifelong impact that has on you. Um, so yeah, I don't, I, that doesn't really answer your question. Let's see if, whether we should, you know, is access the right one? <laughs> um, and, and do you, my initial thoughts. And, and can I challenge for a moment, so Cameron, would you feel we should have a Disability History Month? Uh, um, I guess we probably want to get to a point where we don't need to have it. Yeah. Mm. Where yeah. the whole notion of disability and difference and diversity is just normalized, understood, talked about. It's not, it's nothing kind of about them and us mm -hmm. that we are. Um, but perhaps we're at a time when to create that awareness, we need to show the wider community that, you know, non-disabled people are friends and allies about who we are, where we've come from. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. What's your view, Roddy? What's... Okay. Um, first of all, whether we should have it. I mean, this reminds me of the question that uh, I always get asked as a socialist, uh, would I abolish Christmas? 
And I'd say, no, actually, of course I wouldn't abolish Christmas. I would have Christmas every bloody day of the year. And I think that that's what we should be saying about Disability History Month. You know, the reason we need it is because actually, generally speaking, uh, disability discrimination is one of the most pernicious um, and often implicit um, the, um, kinds of discrimination inside the society, the depths of which many people don't actually understand and the diversity within it, a lot of people don't understand, including a lot of disabled people, it should be added. I was reminded when Cameron was speaking earlier of um, Baroness Jane Campbell, who's one of the leading activists and absolute uh, legends of the disability rights movement, um, who said that when she was growing up, she would cross the street to avoid somebody that she thought had learning difficulties. And I think that that's uh, something that many of us have experienced at various stages of our, um, you know, coming to greater awareness of these things and so on. And uh, as for the theme, I think, well, frankly, you could have anything, couldn't you? Um, but access to me is absolutely the wider thing. It's not about, you know, should there be a, a set of steps in front of the building? It's not about the way in which many people think about disability. Another way of looking at this, as you see, the symbol of disability itself, the wheelchair. So how many people use wheelchairs in Britain? You know, um, some of them who use it some of the time, you add them together, then it's about 12, 13, 14%, something like that. But of course, that's only a tiny minority of people who meet the legal definition of disability who use wheelchairs. And therefore, we're talking about a very large, very diverse and very multifaceted area, disability, in other words. And uh, I think there's 900 different kinds of impairment listed in the latest DWP legislation in relation to disability benefits, for example. And that gives you some idea of uh, the scope and diversity uh, of, of disability as a category. And so therefore, when we're talking about access, yes, I very much agree, we have to talk about it in the widest sense. And uh, one of the widest senses of that is about understanding just how deep that discrimination is. So. We know that, you know, for the last 30, 40 years, when they started taking figures, that is, the degree of uh, unemployment amongst disabled people has hardly changed. About 47% has today. The first figures uh, were around 50, uh, just over 50%. So 47% um, of all disabled people of working age are unemployed. That is an absolute and utter disgrace. Uh, and it really does indicate very clearly just how far we have to go in terms of how far we've come so far. Why do you think why do you think we don't move faster? What I'm often left kind of thinking why when the facts are so clear, government after government, what they do is they will commission more studies, more research reports, but don't actually act on a, a, on on that. What what's preventing? And this week, I, you know, I've been really looking into the mental health crisis and our legislation and our response. And time after time, we hear about horrendous stories about what's going on. Um, and yet we just don't move on it. I'll, um, I'll, I'll maybe have a stab at answering that. Um, because when we were talking last week, uh, whenever it was me and Atif were discussing um, this whole thing um, with an example that I used from 1962. And the thing about it is, is that I think it's even more true than it was when we discussed it, because after all, everything that's shaped in the political discourse recently uh, flows from the election results on the other side of the Atlantic, where one of the world's most famous racists uh, almost got re-elected, despite the fact that he is one of the most overt racists uh, who's ever uh, been in the president of uh, the United States of America, which is quite saying something when you know that, for example, Woodrow Wilson was actually a member of the Ku Klux Klan. So the point I would wish to make about that is that in 1962, two uh, different people um, became famous. One of them was a guy called James Meredith, who was the first black uh, youngster, uh, black man admitted to the University of Mississippi. In order to do that, he had to be accompanied by the National Guard. Right. And um, that was a, that was the first uh, young black man getting into university. Mm. Elsewhere in the United States, Ed Roberts became uh, the first paraplegic to be admitted to university in, uh, in America, the uh, Berkeley University in California in 1962, a quadriplegic wheelchair user. And it was a huge, you know, it was sometimes talked about as the beginning of the disability movement in America, probably quite rightly. 
But you see, what was the key difference between these two people? Um, and I think that the key difference was uh, money. Because to make universities accessible for disabled people, okay, you had to get the National Guard mobilised and that did cost money. But, you know, once uh, black folk were admitted to universities, and you're not really talking about money, you're talking about, you know, racism and prejudice and all, all that that entails. But it doesn't directly involve money. And uh, when you're talking about disabled people, you're talking about assistive software, you're talking about personal independent, um, you know, independent um, personal assistance, for example, ramps, uh, support assistance of one sort or another in the workplace. And therefore you're talking about investing in order to actually provide a degree of equality, a higher degree of access. And that therefore is the nature of disability discrimination. Disabled people are socially and economically marginalized because if you like to purchase their labor, is more expensive. It's not that they're individually less productive, but actually to get disabled people into the workplace costs money. And therefore I think that that's why the particularities of the nature of disability discrimination is for all the things I say are so pernicious. Now I shouldn't go overboard about that because the reason I started with Donald Trump is we also know that this is not just true of disability discrimination. We know it's true of racism. Uh, you know, you know, there's been advances but there's also been retreats. There's been areas where we can say we've moved forward and we can say we were just talking about learning difficulties before the uh, recording started. That there's also been areas where there's been hardly any progress at all. You know, when, when there was a move towards the institutionalization in the late 50s, early 60s, there were all these horror stories of people that had been in the asylums as they were at that time for 30, 40 years. And here we are talking again about people that have been confined to institutions warehouses essentially um, for 15, 20 years or more. And you know, this is this is just unbelievable that we're still having these conversations so far uh, on uh, when we're talking about, you know, society is supposed to be about progress and so on. So yeah, we, we have to have these conversations again because we have to address the areas where change is required and address uh, what's fundamental change and what has changed in the sense that we need to we need to have a conversation about uh, what real change actually requires. I'd like to add to that as well. And I think in answer to Cameron's question, why we're not moving, it's because we don't have enough diversity within the class structures of people mm. in leadership. And I think when we look at um, some of the most profound uh, examples of really good, even civil disobedience, but, it, but also cohesive civil action, mutual aid, et cetera, it's driven through working class communities quite often, merging when needed and supported as an asset with more, more affluent, more say maybe more middle class communities. But when you look at actual the House of Lords itself or and the diversity of the makeup or the lived experience, we can tokenize and see tokenized relationships or people that can be used as examples, as, as enshrined shiny examples. But again, it's incumbent on us to look at the class structure of people, not so much what they've got right now to be in the House of Lords, but how they grew up as children and what they could have access and what they couldn't and what that mm. did, mm. what that did to the child to then to inform a useful, a meaningful adult that could engage and strengthen policy. But that's not what we have. We have a House of Lords that's largely until very recently was just based on hereditary titles. Yeah. Ramifications for that are huge. Um, we're going to watch intergenerational discussions and we're going to watch money being hemorrhaged on her focus groups saying, why don't we do this more? Why can we do whilst we're going to watch the disability employment gap <laughs> continue to strengthen the polarization of social economic access, just continue to socially uh, polarize choices. And we're going to say, why is it that we can't get disabled community to talk to us? <laughs> it will go on and on. I think we've got to recognize that, look, the asset in the room, um, the consultancy is all around you. It's, but it is talking about this in the lens of, as we've touched on in the intersectionality and the impact. I suppose for me, the disability, if I can offer this prov provocation, I wasn't sure if I was supposed to as a chair, but I'm gonna do it now. <laughs> it's, it's, I'm of course, I'm interested in access. But Cameron's really touched on it really well. Some people, organizations, you'll see it, they'll feel they're very radical because they've done a tour of what's it like to be in their office in a wheelchair. And they've said, okay, we've noticed we need ramps here. We've noticed the lift isn't easy for some people here. We've noticed this, we've noticed that's great. So we've really done a lot on access here. What they haven't done is saying, try sitting in a wheelchair not knowing you can't get off it. Try sitting in a wheelchair knowing you've got to be an ambassador 
the wheelchair users every single time someone opens the door. Try to sit in a wheelchair knowing that this isn't just about a wheelchair, but this is about job security or insecurity or about pensions uh, or even physical bullying. And all those things play a ramification and they're, they're psychological. I mean, you can't yeah. separate those things, I suppose. And then Cameron, if, if I may say, when you've added race into that, or heritage, cultural heritage, it's, it's, it, it is wholly relevant, yeah? Um, and Absolutely, so I, I mean, I think there's, a, the, and, and part of that is as soon as, as soon as you have a visual impairment, the world looks at you differently. Mm -hmm. People see you different. They mm -hmm. respond to you, react to you, involve you in such a different way. Um, mm -hmm. Just because, and, you know, as a wheelchair user, I just can't hide the fact that I'm a wheelchair user. There's, there's very little way. The only way I've ever managed to do that was when I dressed up as Darth Vader. I was just a very small Darth Vader. Um, <laughs> my chair hid under the cloak, but <laughs> um, uh, and I've lost my train of thought. But no, so yeah, so the world sees you very differently. And, and my experience of my friends who are non-disabled people, the experiences they've had, are very different to ones I've had in similar situations just because of how people perceive me and who I am um, and that's even before you know you you bring in the layer of color and race yeah, yeah. Uh, well I mean if it's not intersectional in its understanding then it's not relevant in its understanding Do you know? yeah. really I mean and I, I, I don't feel being overly bold in saying so I think we are have got so much work to climb into to say, look, make this work, not because it's the right thing to do, but it's costing you money, you know? Make this work because we are not gonna get there. We're gonna have these kind of conversations forever, not recognizing that it is about impact as well as access and then to, to, and to not to separate the two things. Um, so, I, so but Roddy sort of reminded me in a, in a kind of, I suppose in a really lovely way actually, uh, and it sort of gives me a chance to talk about why we should have a Disney History Month. Of course we should, because we're here to talk about it. We're talking about the history that's lost, the invisible pages that never got written, uh, and to insist that these lives have always mattered and that we're richer as a community, as a civil society because of it. And we don't get there unless we talk about it. But I also share the same sentiments. It's wonderful to know that we don't have to. A time may come. Um, I think about my 17 year old nephew, who is very dear to me, he was the best man at my wedding when he was only seven. And, and I also think about a moment when many years, well, 12 years ago now, um, you know, Barack Obama became president. Um, he lost to John McCain. At five years old, my same, my same nephew was five at the time. And he was really excited by a wrestler also called McCain. Um, I, don't, I wasn't really sure why, but the, the the excitement that I felt jumping around at the idea that a black man had become president of America was incredible on the day. Um, I won't go into details of whether Obama was good or bad, but just the sense of what had happened in America was really something for me uh, 12 years ago. And as I jumped up and down, he threw a little chair, his little plastic chair at me, and was really angry that his guy, or what he believed was his guy, McCain, had lost. And then he kept saying, so what, so what? And then as I held him up and gave him a hug, I said to him, because you don't understand, a black, a black man has become president of America. What that says for the rest of the world is incredible. And then he looked at me and said, yeah, so what? So what? I don't care. And then I remember looking at him thinking, yeah, you're five years old. You, you should be the so what generation. When somebody tells you, you know, a, a, a black person has become president of a country. You should be the generation that says, so what? You know, when somebody tells you a blind woman is becoming prime minister of this country, you should be the generation that says, so what? Because we've been doing that stuff for years, you know? Like, a good, I won't be part of that generation. And I, and I expect no, none of, the, none of the, the three of us will be. But it doesn't mean we can't be part of a generation that seeds that, you know, and Absolutely. make it really meaningful. I think where I'd like to see it go is that we teach our history to children in schools yeah and that includes all of our histories you know mm -hmm. a diverse range of it mm -hmm. oh, absolutely absolutely so Roddy I was just going to say the danger is in my view and I was one of the people who uh, was very very uh, emotional and um, on the night that Obama got elected 
Um, but the danger looking back on it now is that if Kamala Harris becomes the first black woman president of the United States, then the vast majority of black people in America are going to shrug their shoulders and say, so what? because actually so little of their lives have changed. And in many respects, their lives have got worse. And actually the brutal truth is many black people's lives are much worse than they were um, uh, when uh, uh, Obama took office. And in fact, it was the, the absolute cataclysmically awful letting down of the hopes of the people uh, that elected Obama that's uh, partly responsible for um, the ability of Trump to, to, to nearly get re-elected this time around. And this is something that, you know, the Democrats uh, have not learned. And I think that's a tremendously important issue. You see, the thing about the intersectionality for me is that on the one hand, for people to discuss this at a time, I mean, let's put this in context, right? Black Lives Matter is a bigger movement than the black civil rights movement was, you know, the number of people demonstrating in American cities is many times more than it actually was way back in the 60s. That's the one thing that people, I think, need to recognize about it. It's absolutely huge movement. Um, and the thing about it is, however, is that it's been a largely black and white movement, which was not the case for the black civil rights movement. So at a time when people are discovering and discovering and prioritizing unity to fight racism, the thing is that intersectionality for some people has come up as a means of building that solidarity, as a means of understanding. I want to understand what it is that mm -hmm. uh, is about your situation that's not this true of my situation. Mm -hmm. And that's an inst a, a really good instinct. Mm -hmm. However, if it becomes a kind of thing of check your privilege, then to me that's actually not helpful. Because if you think about the, all the debate, for example, about key workers, suddenly we discovered key workers during the coronavirus pandemic. Mm -hmm. And we were talking about how important they are to the economy and all the rest of it, and how more likely they were to die and all the rest of it. Mm -hmm. But the discussion we had about uh, BME people or black people being more likely to die was a separate discussion. But actually it shouldn't be, because the truth of the matter is, is that if you're black, you're more likely to be a key worker, you're more likely to be a porter, or whatever inside the National Health Service Hospital, you're more likely to be a nurse and you're less likely to be a sister. If you're a junior doctor, you're likely to stay a junior doctor, et cetera, et cetera. Mm. And therefore, some of the reasons we begin to understand why there is a higher degree of death amongst, uh, amongst black people uh, in, in, in the pandemic. And the same is true of disabled people, which is why this is a very relevant discussion today, because actually we have seen the ramping up of, um, of discrimination across all the different equalities fields uh, as a consequence of the pandemic. And that's part of the context, I think, for this discussion, which is why I think the, the question of intersectionality is so important. Because to me, the biggest intersection is class. To me, the biggest uh, intersection is the fact that, you know, you're far more likely to, uh, to be, be disadvantaged fundamentally um, by, 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 by the discrimination that you experience if you have no money, if yeah. you're working class, if you come from, I mean, you know, Baroness Campbell, um, you know, as, as, a, as you said, I think you were implying that what I said, at uh, a different kettle of fish to somebody who actually doesn't have any resources, uh, any background of, of wealth or advantage and so on, or to speak of, or articulate middle class parents who are going to fight for your rights to get access to education, etc. Most people who are disabled don't have these advantages. And the people that founded and built our movement by and large did have these advantages. That's the irony, isn't it? Otherwise we wouldn't have the movement <laughs> of articulate spokespeople, you know, who have the advantage of actually being in that situation. That's a contradiction, isn't yeah. it? Well, I mean, no, but there's a space in which power and powerlessness speaks to itself, you know, and those who have agency aren't, all, you know, aren't all so cold hearted that they can see where, they're, where to exercise that power. Mm. Um, but yeah, you're absolutely class. When I think about the NHS, for example, and frontline workers, I'm thinking also about the fifth largest employer in the world. I'm thinking about the largest employer in Europe. And I'm thinking about key workers, as, as, as I'm sure every, everyone did on those Thursday eight o'clock claps, clapping. But, but you're, we, we have to be cognizant of, even the NHS openly, where they have a report, which they call the Snowy White Peaks. Um, yeah. And that report is very much about policy makers, the heads of trust and decision makers and implementers. And those are very much as you climb into the NHS, 
an, an institution made up of so many black experiences and disabled experiences and black disabled co-joined experiences. And yet at that policy level, at that systematic paces of salary and change, we are faced with snowy white peaks. Um, I think that's just not just true of the NHS, it's true of almost every sector. I mean, you look at the voluntary sector, charity sector, whatever you want to mm. call it. Um, there was a report recently, you know, about exactly this point. And yet in a sector that often talks about these issues and kind of campaigns on them, when you get to the senior levels, there isn't that diversity again. It just doesn't mm. exist. Um, I, I often find myself roundtable meetings with chief execs who are who look nothing like me have no experience that i've had um are white you know um similar well educated yeah. you know and, uh, similar for me as well and yet i find uh, and i would i was sort of so to echo what roddy said i find i'm on forever having a class discussion that's perceived as a race discussion <laughs> And, uh, and I wonder if I were just a bit more whiter, that I, that could be more articulated, <laughs> you know, <laughs> it would be understood better. Um, you know, I often find myself having political discussions, having to tell people, you know, I'm, I'm agnostic, if not an atheist, but I get lost in that space of thinking, um, you know, I can feel the judgment and, and the need to, 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 to rush to say, hey, I'm not religious, as if that should matter, you know, yeah. in the context of things. There are powerful discussions here. I guess I'm going to ask as well. We're sort of coming to, 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 to I guess, towards the middle end of what we're doing. Is the question I've got is, I think you guys, we, you know, as a group, we've talked about it a lot in, in, in a lot of detail as well in terms of the politics and the social economics and the choices of class structure. Um, I would ask, you know, in your in your certain organisations that you guys have worked in, are there any key achievements that you think are really personally key for you I, I, and in your respective organizations perhaps that have happened when you weren't there or when you when you have been there that really shine a, a sort of beacon of light for what the future thinking could be you know how, what, what what is it that you feel and said look actually we've done this here you know we, we've done this we've achieved this here and in that space be it a microcosm of a larger community addressing a larger need this really mattered and it really hit home if I think about diversity and abilities work, I'm really proud that here we are being so needed in this COVID dynamics that we're not sitting here going, oh, we have got no work. We, we are working longer hours than we've ever done. Um, it's more meaningful than it's, well, it's just as meaningful as it was in 2019, I guess. If I think about the work we're doing on anti-homelessness, we are arguing the point that the impact of neurodivergency, the impact of learning isolation, the impact of mental health, is having a consequence on keeping people safe. We're saying that assistive technology plays a role in measuring how people are participating and combating learning isolation. And fundamentally, we're saying, don't wait till people can access a 300 pound diagnosis in order to prove a point. The, the need is there. And I'm really proud that we're able to, to anticipate that because of the impact and the lack of access. And I'm really glad that we have so many lived experiences teaching that, making it real. These are things that for us, I know largely we're very well known in higher education and the support that we do there. I'm very proud of that work there. But I keep thinking all the time about where our impact is felt most. Well, probably is a higher education. It's 22,000 disabled students that have worked with DNA. But where I strongly feel is our biggest passion is probably going to be about a team that's working hard to address social economic loss and to support those who aren't able to advocate very well and at times not even able to protect their own shelter. Um, so those are the sort of spaces I think about is we've managed to shift the dial on that but it's not stuff that people would know about. Um, I guess some people know more about what we've achieved in universities and in particular building Imperial University's own or helping to build Imperial University's own thinking on inclusive campuses. But anyhow, um, I just wanted to share a thought with, for your experience, what do you feel, Cameron, I guess you're gonna say DRUK or maybe others, what do you feel that's happened there that particularly shines a light on a key achievement that could make tomorrow's thinking better? And, and Roddy, I'd ask the same of you. I think certainly the recent period, 
I guess just thinking about as we've gone through the pandemic, the lockdowns um, since March and slightly earlier, um, Disability Rights UK has played its absolute part that it was designed to do, which was and has always been to be the voice of disabled people, to amplify the voice of disabled people who quite often are not asked for their voice to be heard, um, don't have the platforms to make themselves heard. It's been our job to articulate that so that we can challenge government on how they've approached issues, how they've approached this whole pandemic, how, um, you know, everything from the, the do not resuscitate orders going out, how, um, how unacceptable that was, how outrageous that was, that that was happening, and that we were able to galvanise, you know, over two and a half thousand people from a Friday evening to the Monday morning when the open letter to the NHS went out to co-sign it, that prompted a direct response from the chief exec of NHS England, um, that Baroness Jane Campbell was able to use to write to um, the NHS. So our role has been is to, is to hold government to account, to challenge them, to bring the voice of disabled people to them um, in, in different ways, in, in a way of challenge, in a way of kind of helping to um, respond to the pandemic, um, to critique um, and to advise. Um, and we've done that really powerfully. And what's really shown is the number of times a week and every day we get approached by the media to comment on what's going on. Um, so I think that kind of function of the organization that we talk about is that we everything we're doing is to connect with a very diverse range of people from different backgrounds um, and geographical backgrounds throughout the country and bring them together into a unified voice um, about our rights and our inclusion. And that's been really useful and powerful during this particular, it's, it's really shown the value of that. So kind of that, that's that been, I guess, I would like to think, you know, some members of the public would have seen, and certainly I hope disabled people have seen that that's what we've been doing. I think the kind of other stuff that we do in the background that maybe isn't as well known is our leadership program aimed at disabled people to uh, it's part of our desire to make sure that disabled people uh, move into positions of influence and power um, that they move into higher structures of organizations and that they you know the glass ceiling for disabled people is much lower and that we help them break through that through um, peer-led uh, leadership programs um, that you know, create space for disabled people to talk about the experience of being an employee or to run their own business and the challenges they face and to work out solutions together of how you break through some of those issues. Um, to the work we do through our helplines, the, the people who ring our student helplines or the, our independent living helpline, people who are having their care reduced quietly by local authorities go unchallenged until you know that individual picks up that phone talks to us and someone on the end of the phone who has that lived experience of what it's like to receive a support package from their local authority and how to challenge how to assert your rights um, so those individuals who we help day in day out and we may never hear from them again and that's okay because you know as long as we've given them the tools the information and what they needed to achieve, you know, what, what they wanted to do. So there's lots of that kind of work that goes on in the backgrounds all the time through to, we've been working around, you know, getting disabled people to lead, lead more active lives. And what are the barriers that are preventing disabled people from being active? Um, how social workers and um, other professionals can be the barrier. Um, and we're just about to start, you know, work around a new set of social worker guidelines that we've produced with um, university, universities and uh, the work that we did in the previous four years to try and shift that kind of the blocks that exist in, in, in institutions like social care and social work. Um, 
yeah so, so they're kind of the sorts of things that we i would say we're proud of and i think you know it, it's as an organization we are changing we are um i think by chance diuk appointed a uh, an asian person as chief exec um i've then been working with our board and our staff to say we you know the organization needs to be reflecting our community um, better and i think you know we're on a journey uh, we're, we're starting to diversify the board and achieve your part of our board mm -hmm. and you know that was one of the reasons i reached out to you in our relationship before you were a board member mm -hmm. um, bringing you on our ambassadors we've got more diverse ambassadors uh, team within the organization is more diverse our head of policy is an asian blind woman um, mm -hmm. and that's happened because we've made you know we're actively working on it um, yeah yeah, yeah. And, we're on uh, and having been able to witness a lot of what you've just said there um sometimes from a distance and sometimes that close i i am i can say yeah i'm deeply proud of so much of the work that's gone on in thinking you know and it, and, and the response particularly to covid that's left me really in awe of where, how far dr uk has stamped its relevance you know on how we're going to get through these crises you know, so it's glad to be on board just a personal thing for me um, <laughs> roddy i'm yeah i'm going to sharply disagree with both of you i'm sorry but, um, I, I really don't i don't agree with this narrative and i don't agree with the question i don't think it's an appropriate question in these times that we're in at the moment we are in cataclysmically awful terrible dark times and I feel no mood to pat myself or anybody else on the back for the gains for disabled people. And mm. um, we are dealing with a situation where we shouldn't be talking about how we deal or regulate with the misery in the margins. We are talking about a fundamental attack on disabled people's rights, right to live even, uh, and the resurrection of one of the most fundamental pseudoscientific evils that uh, we have seen, eugenics. Uh, you know, Boris Johnson and Dominic Cummings are supporters of eugenics. And I don't think this is a central issue because I think that really the fundamental thing is disabled people are marginalized because, you know, they don't care uh, more than anything else. But I think that the point is, what is the disability rights movement around that, about this time around? You know, I mean, think about the name of the, one of the most famous organizations, quite rightly, Disabled People Against Cuts right? Mm -hmm. uh, it's about trying to stop the reverse of the gains of the last 40, 50 years. The disability rights movement in the 60s, 70s, 80s, particularly the 80s and the 90s, was about trying to fight for anti-discrimination legislation, to fight for benefits such as disability living allowance and so on. These benefits have been undermined. 600,000 people have lost entitlement to what is now personal independence payment at the stroke of a pen. It's not that there's less disabled people. Well, actually, there is, because disability has been redefined. So the government mm -hmm. wants to get rid of disabled people, not to get rid of disability, which I would agree with. I'd love to get rid of disability. I think everybody should be enabled. We should have a world where people are, are fundamentally enabled. We don't. Um, and I think that we need to, therefore, be honest with ourselves and say that, you know, the strategy, you know, for example, of black faces in high places, well, how, how well did that go? How well did it go to get uh, the David Blunkett elected as Home Secretary, the first blind Home Secretary? How well did that benefit blind people across the country, working class people? Are they, are they more likely to get a job? Are they more likely to get into employment as a consequence of having a Home Secretary who was blind? I think not. I think that the figures would back that up. So I think that therefore what we really need to be talking about is we need a more powerful movement. Mm. We need a movement rooted in the power of our side. And I think that that fair means locating the, the fight for disability rights within the wider fight against the, the evils of the society that we live in, which is a society designed to meet the needs of a tiny minority of people to maximise their profits, the lumping billionaires, if you like, that Trump caters to, uh, mm. as against the ordinary great unwashed of this world, you know, um, the, the, the working class people who have no advantage to gain whatsoever from racism. Uh, from bigotry, from sexual uh, discrimination, from disability discrimination, from homophobia and all the rest of it. They don't have an interest in these things. The bankers go laughing all the way to the local, uh, the local bank and so on. So I think that that really, we, we've got to change the narrative in my view. I think that we need to be...
we need to be talking about a fundamental challenge to, to this system, which has let us all down and is not delivering on any of the potential that some of the things it produces, the wondrous things it produces, new technology, scientific advancements and so on, all the things that you know, I wrote about in the book, uh, the potential for society to deliver a new world is there, but because it's not delivered to meet the needs of ordinary people, it cannot deliver on that promise. That, that's a fundamental contradiction we all face, I think. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Roddy. Uh, yeah, um, powerfully said. I mean, we are facing, a, you know, globally, internationally, socially, as we're often hearing, you know, we are all in the same storm, but we are not in the same boat. That, you know, these statements can never be more true. Uh, the questions around eugenics, the normalization of that in itself was shocking into the society within mm. it. Uh, the ease in which such conversations were displayed, yeah, for me, left me quite, quite bereft with understanding of calculating and how far removed we are from a cal from an egalitarian uh, sort of politics in this country, do you know? But then I do very much look at this mutual aid stuff and things that happen in local participation and be it even working, if not especially working class participation uh, and people's engagement. That gave me a lot to, to sit back and think, look, we can role model better stuff, even if it isn't happening at the top echelons of power where corporate greed and to a large extent, um, the kind of conversations that even under Margaret Thatcher's government, people would have in hushed corners, you know, that have become normalized here. I, I agree, there's a lot of regression going on, but it's also taking a stock of the things that are saying over the past 25 years, that people can say, look, we're talking about this in a, with a vision and a power that we've never done before. We're able to connect to communities in a, in a speed that which we've never been done before. And technology has played a role in that space. But ultimately, and I suppose for, for me, I'll finish on this, is that it's keeping the heart of all these changes and innovations, if they're happening, where they're happening, knowing that they only work because of human-centered solutions, not because of technology, not even because of government policy, because at the heart of this, these are human-centered solutions designed by communities to address human-centered needs. Keeping that at the heart of what we do to make sure the engagement is measured, it's real, and it's based on social economics and access. It's based on psychological and social impact is how we get this through. But until that point, yeah, we are gonna be watching, I guess, the conversations that we wanna see strengthened, but knowing they often are only strengthened in silos. They're only often largely talked about by corporate powers in a particular month of the year. And when that happens, we do all lose far too much and it is avoidable. I think I'll finish on this one thing and ask you both just if you had perhaps one sentence. I was gonna say Roddy to be hopeful, but I, I think you'd be fair. I, think, I don't know if hope, keeping Christmas, I'll, I'll just satisfy myself if you're willing to do that. But I would say this is, is, is there one, one or two sentences that you think would make the next Disability History Month next year? worth celebrating so much stronger and much more, I guess, with a sense of meaning and, and authenticity to the, to the issues that matter. What would it look like? What would that Disability History Month look like? I, I mean, I think that that's a very difficult thing to do because I think that, as I said, I think that we have to raise our sights. I think that we have to be much more ambitious about what we need the, the reality is that we're dealing with a situation where our rights are being stripped away from us, our lives are being made worse. Mm -hmm. We are living in a country where there are lakes of pain. And what we need to do, I think, is to try and nourish the hope that does exist in every little struggle to support NHS workers or to support, mm -hmm. you know, the rights of, uh, of, 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 of bus drivers, many of them black, who've died because they haven't adequate protection and letting people onto their buses. Um, and, and lots of the people who have had to work during this pandemic getting more rights as well. That in its turn is going to mean more rights for disabled people. So to me, I think that we need to break down the barriers that separate the idea that disabled people are, are them, other, over mm -hmm. there. Right. And the rest of us aren't them. I think that breaking down these barriers, I think, is probably the way to go. And the, the idea that um, disability is a problem for somebody else 
uh, is, is really something that needs to get broken down. And I think that means tackling the narrative of, you know, end the awkward and see the person. These are individualised, you know, stuff that blame individuals for individual prejudice. I think that we have to get to the roots of the problem, which is the institutions, the nature of society more widely that underpins, perpetuates and strengthens and um, that, that discrimination. And that we need, to, we need to get to the heart of that if we are to look for fundamental change uh, and, and to get rid of disability and to liberate disabled people from, from, from discrimination. Thank you, Roddy, thank you, That's powerful. Uh, and Cameron? Yeah, so I mean, I, I think we, we talked about kind of the, this idea of a movement um, and so we're just right now talking about in our organization about some of these more fundamental issues that uh, Roddy, you've just been talking about really well. Um, and this idea of building a movement of not just disabled people, but kind of our allies and friends as well. Um, and just exactly what you've just said, that this is not just about an issue about one particular group of people. Um, this is a societal issue that we need mm -hmm. to tackle and we, we can only really do it if we all get behind it because people currently in positions of power are not interested in listening to disabled people. Um, and so we're talking about this idea of, you know, creating a movement and, and making sure that um, what, what are the fundamental things that that movement should be looking to change um, and bringing not just, so it's not just becomes about what disabled people want, but it's what our friends and allies want to create this better society. Um, so for me, kind of something about that would be interesting to me uh, because it, it's something that we, so we've just done our theory of change and that's what it's coming up out as is one of the most powerful things we could do is to build that movement. Brilliant. Well, look, guys, I think that's where we'll finish there. I'm building a movement that's cohesive. It's centered around the experiences and lived experiences as assets, recognizing the, the hopelessness of not bringing this challenge into class positions. Uh, and very much, I think for me as well, being humbled by the reality of lived experiences when people are sharing them. Um, that, that has always been compelling and <coughs> it remains so. The lessons learned over this last two years have shown us the lessons that we needed to learn perhaps over the last 50 years, and what COVID is gonna demonstrate and show to us and how people get through it and how they've survived it will only be because of lived experiences and cross participation sports supporting each other so i would really like to see next years if they, we get to do one or following years to talk about the lessons that we've learned over covid uh, even if people are sick to hearing about it i want to see what people can understand that it was community participation and community engagement that made this work and how did it do it and how did it strategize itself it did it by anticipating that so many people are feeling unsafe so many people are not answering their door and so many people still need access to food and resources. And with that, it tells us how we can do much stronger when we are connecting. Um, but yeah, absolutely. There's so much here. I, I have to say, I'll, I'll stop there. And I just want to say, I'm really, I don't really know how to articulate it so well, but just to say, I'm really grateful to both of you giving so much time, the energy to this. Um, and it's all that I hope that the talk would have been really. Or could have been from both of you. So I'm, I'm and I'm the two people that I'm very grateful to personally know and consider friends. So thank you. <laughs>